Hi everyone. Um, thank you for giving me the opportunity to present at uh, ACAS 2020. Uh, my name is Alessandro Riccardi. I am a device engineer uh, working in the R&D section at uh, Webit Nano. Um, so in this presentation, I will uh, discuss a fully integrated spiky neural network using silicon oxide-based uh, RIRAM as synaptic device. Um, let me briefly give an outline uh, about um, uh, what I will discuss. I will start with a brief introduction about uh, RIRAM technology uh, for those of you who are not familiar maybe with the technology. And then I will uh, discuss the use of RIRAM uh, um, for artificial intelligence. Um, and finally, we'll uh, go on discussing the circuit, uh, the main results we got and an overview of um, the working principle and system performance. And finally, I will draw my conclusions. So RIRAM technology um, is an emerging non-volatile memory technology. Um, uh, the working principle is um, uh, fairly easy. It's based on the creation and disruption of a conductive filament of defects within a metal insulator metal structure, uh, such as the one depicted here. Um, the idea is that through, if we apply a positive voltage bias to the top electrode, um, we can induce a forming uh, uh, process, which is basically a soft breakdown of the oxide, which creates a conductive filament of defects uh, shunting the top and bottom electrode. And this way the device can be brought into a low resistive state or conductive state. And then ideally if we uh, control this process in current, um, we, when we apply a negative voltage polarity, we can induce um, some kind of an opposite uh, uh, event, which is called the reset, which uh, basically consists in the depletion of the uh, conductive filament locally, creating an insulating gap. And this brings the device into a high resistive state. Now, of course, we can cycle between these two states, and uh, this, depending on the technology, can be done uh, typically several millions of times or even more. Um, now, RIRAM has attracted a lot of attention because of its high scalability, um, because of the filamentary nature of the device. Uh, we typically do not care too much about um, the device area. Uh, it is easy to integrate. It, it is considered typically easy, easier to integrate than other uh, um, uh, emerging technologies. Stacks tend to be easier uh, to deposit. And uh, it is considered also uh, ideal to mimic biological synapses because the ionic movements happening in RIRAMs uh, very closely resemble uh, the mechanisms um, in biological systems. Um, for this reason, uh, RIRAM uh, was um, attracted a lot of attention uh, for its use as an optic element in neural networks. And this is the main application for RIRAM uh, in artificial intelligence, really. So there are two main domains where we can move. Uh, the first one is the domain of uh, deep neural network accelerators. So this means uh, uh, basically using arrays to speed up MAC operations by performing analog computation. Uh, the other domain is uh, um, always related to neural network and using RIRAM as signups, but um, um, with, uh, let's say, neural networks that uh, propagate information in a very different way, that is um, uh, spiking neural networks, uh, which are in the context of neuromorphic computing systems. So the idea is to have neurons connected by synapses and, and the neurons uh, communicate with discrete um, events in time called spikes, differently com uh, compared to um, classical neural networks where the inputs are continuous and also the outputs. Um, this spiking approach is considered to be uh, the origin of the great uh, uh, computing efficiency of the human brain uh, uh, if compared to, you know, any other computing system. Um, and this is why it is uh, considered very interesting uh, for implementing uh, um, very high energy efficiency and energy efficient um, uh, systems for on-chip recognition, uh, edge applications and uh, this kind of things. Uh, of course, uh, it's not only the spiking approach, um, developing a system that is, uh, let's say, efficient um, from this point of view uh, requires to um, emulate a little bit more closely what happens in the human brain, which means we need a massive parallel um, uh, computing with the intertwined memory and computation. So um, <clears throat> there is the need of development of high density computational storage, uh, which is why uh, emerging memories are very important nowadays. And then uh, um, of course, uh, 
what, what we said before, digital communication between neurons, which means spike coding, and analog computation, which means uh, integration of the spikes by the neurons, um, which should be analog. So these more or less are the guidelines <coughs> that uh, uh, should be followed in the implementation of any uh, neuromorphic computing systems. And uh, spiking neural networks are typically then associated with, uh, um, with uh, uh, intrinsically spiking hardware, such as uh, uh, event-based cameras, for example. Now, our work consists in uh, an implementation of a proof of concept uh, spiking network for uh, recognition of uh, MNIST digits, and uh, it was implemented using uh, um, our silicon oxide based resistive memory. So, uh, WeBit is developing this uh, uh, resistive memory technology in, uh, uh, in partnership with the CEA Leti. And this is because it was found that silicon oxide has uh, good physical characteristics such as a good resistive window, easily tunable thickness and stoichiometry, and excellent high temperature stability, uh, along with uh, uh, you know, uh, more obvious manufacturability characteristics such as the fact that it's a fully com CMOS compatible material and it represents a very cost effective solution for uh, uh, you know, um, implementation of um, uh, an expensive rear arm. Um, so now moving to the uh, discussion of the circuit and our system uh, working principle and performance. As I said, um, uh, this is a proof of concept uh, spiking neural network uh, performing recognition of MNIST digits. Uh, the learning is done offline. I will uh, comment a little bit more about that uh, in the next slides. Um, but um, uh, we have uh, basically a working demo that was demonstrated last year as at uh, the Flash Memory Summit. So the idea is that the user can draw a digit on a tablet, which is connected then to an FPGA, which is then connected to the chip. Um, then we have uh, uh, that the, the drawing of the user is converted into a 12 times 12 pixel. Um, so it is downscaled and uh, to each pixel uh, we assign a, a, a grayscale uh, level on a, in, in 256 uh, total levels, which is converted into a spike frequency. Um, and this conversion uh, happens on the, uh, on the FPGA devices, not on the chip. Um, then uh, the FPGA sends the uh, relative number of spikes for um, each pixel uh, to, the, um, uh, to the neurons, which integrate uh, the incoming spikes, weight by the, the synaptic weights, and, uh, uh, and then fire out when necessary. I will enter more into the details of uh, the working principle of this uh, in the next slides. But for now, um, just a couple of, uh, you know, words about the details of the, regarding the system. Uh, this is a chip uh, in uh, co-integrating uh, RERAM and uh, uh, CMOS. Uh, probably, the, 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 to, to our knowledge, the first um, chip integrating uh, spiking network with RERAMs. Uh, it is based on a 130 nanometer process with five layers of copper interconnects and 11.5K uh, uh, RERAMs in one t one r configuration. And the total chip size is uh, 1.8 millimeter squared. So uh, a couple of words about the model training. As I said, uh, it was trained uh, offline. So we don't have any online learning uh, on the chip. Uh, it was trained using a classical backpropagation uh, um, uh, algorithm uh, using uh, a, a nonlinear uh, hyperbolic tangent uh, activation function. Um, then the model is converted into um, a spiking equivalent, um, keeping into account that we need an integrated fire uh, neuron with the two threshold, one positive and one negative, and a refractory pin. Um, and this um, conversion was first formalized in this um, reference, and it was adapted in our case um, for integrated fire neuron. In this reference, you find um, the conversion in a leaky integrated fire model. Um, once the weights are obtained, um, they are uploaded on the chip, and so the devices are programmed in LRS or HRS, and uh, this is a full uh, uh, map of the weights. Uh, the green devices are uh, LRS, and the red devices are HRS. You don't see multiple levels because 
um, synopses uh, are, uh, are not uh, uh, implemented uh, um, uh, with a multi-level capability of reROMs, but uh, uh, following another uh, method that I will explain later. Now, um, just a, a general overview about the system architecture so that you can better understand how the recognition process uh, is carried out um, once uh, the, the, the image is fed to the network. Um, the main components of the recognition system are the memory array and the analog neurons, obviously. Um, each square in this uh, representation is a synapse uh, and uh, each row uh, which corresponds to a word line of the array, uh, is a pixel. Uh, so you can already see that uh, each pixel is uh, um, connected to each neuron and vice versa. So this is a fully connected um, uh, single layer perceptron. The idea is that, uh, uh, as we said, the grayscale is converted into, um, uh, into spikes. And uh, so we have a certain number of spikes for each grayscale value for each pixel. And uh, we are just sending uh, uh, events, spikes as events, representing the um, X and Y coordinate of the pixel. Uh, they're stored into a FIFO. And then uh, each spike, uh, uh, each event is decoded uh, through an address decoder, uh, which activates the, um, the corresponding word lines. And uh, at that point, a read operation is performed on uh, the neurons. This is done for each spike, for each pixel. And uh, as, as we integrate more and more, uh, the neurons will start spiking out and uh, these spiking events are collected into FIFO and uh, then analyzed by the, the GA system. Um, we have a, since this is a spiking network, we need a, a time uh, uh, analysis of the output, let's say. Uh, so we have a, a termination parameter, delta S, that is the difference between the first and the second, the number of spikes emitted by the first and the second most spiking neuron. Um, and this allows to determine the winning neuron. As well. If we set a threshold for this quantity, uh, we can calibrate the, uh, the recognition uh, accuracy and energy. Um, a couple of words now about the design of synapses and neurons. As I said before, uh, for uh, concerning the synapses, they're not used as a multi-level um, um, with a multi-level design. Uh, this is something that could be certainly improved. For now, uh, what we are uh, doing is we are using uh, um, eight free RAMs in total. Four of them uh, represent the excitatory component and four of them represent the inhibitory component. They're used in a unary fashion in the sense that uh, this is not a digital representation. Uh, we can have uh, four values for the excitatory, four values for the inhibitory, or the value zero. Uh, and, and this means basically that it depends on how many devices you have in low resistive state. Okay, so this is more or less a three-bit equivalent representation. You have nine values and not eight, but you get them all. Um, uh, and, and then uh, these uh, are connected to the analog neurons. Um, the currents are mirrored into the, into the neuron uh, so that uh, we don't have voltage drops that uh, might uh, modify the, uh, the value of the, of the synapse. And uh, we integrate the currents on a 200 femtofarad capacitor. Uh, with the course, of course, uh, currents are weighted. Um, and then uh, um, each time uh, we surpass a, a threshold value either for positive or negative spikes in the neuron, uh, the state of the neuron is reset. Um, and the integration and reset continue during the refractory period of the neuron. Um, and, uh, and, and the output spikes are basically um, accumulated, so we are accumulating positive or negative output spikes, but at the end of the refractory period, uh, the positive and negative are compensated and uh, the remaining are sent out uh, as a, a actual uh, spiking events. And for the recognition, we only care about the positive spikes. Uh, to conclude, a couple of words about uh, uh, the main system performance. Um, we characterized uh, some parameters of the network, such as the recognition accuracy, obviously, and um, uh, the energy consumption per synaptic event. You can see that the recognition accuracy was characterized uh, depending on the termination parameter that we chose. Um, um, and, and like this, we can tune the accuracy up to a maximum of 82%. And the theoretical limit um, was uh, uh, simulated in, uh, according to simulations, 
that were performed uh, internally by, by the group uh, were uh, estimated to be around 88% uh, limited by the topology uh, of uh, the simple um, uh, single layer perceptron. Then uh, um, uh, this, um, this uh, termination parameter does not only define the accuracy, but of course also the uh, energy consumption, because depending on the termination parameter, you will have uh, um, a different uh, num average number of spikes for uh, performing the recognition. Um, and uh, the, the energy consumption per synaptic event was calculated to be around 180 picojoule. Um, with triple codule at the synaptic level and the rest uh, dissipated basically by the SPI interface and, uh, um, and uh, um, uh, the circuitry of the, of the, of the network. Uh, here on the, on the top right, you can see a table with uh, a comparison with uh, some, of, uh, some of some reference works uh, from the state of the art. Um, uh, the, the first two works are uh, much more complex uh, spiking neural network systems, of course. They use SRAM, not VRAM, as, um, uh, to store weights, and um, they are digital systems. Um, and they have many more synapses and are fully reconfigurable, but uh, I think that we can at least take a look at the, the um, energy consumption per synaptic event and compare with us. And you can see that there is a difference, but uh, uh, it is also, in our case, a very different technology node. And as I said, the most of uh, our energy dissipation comes from uh, the communication interface uh, with the chip. So this is something that can surely be improved. And finally, I have uh, a, a comparison with a non-spiking uh, network that performs actually, uh, this is from Panasonic, uh, it performs uh, recognition of MNIST digits. So it made sense for us to, um, to compare. And they can achieve a 90% accuracy uh, with three layers. Um, and in our case, we have 82% with just one layer. And um, uh, the power consumption is, uh, um, is similar, but uh, uh, considering that we, you know, we are in a uh, worse technology node, that uh, can be improved in our case. Uh, so finally, some conclusions. Um, uh, as, uh, as we saw, um, uh, as we discussed uh, in the introduction, spiking neural networks will be uh, very interesting to enable on chip uh, and uh, energy efficient recognition tasks for edge uh, AI application, especially. Um, they are a very hot topic uh, right now in, um, in, uh, in uh, the community and uh, they will probably gain more and more uh, interest. Um, we are for sure at the first iterations of the implementation of these networks. Even in our case, as I said, it is a, a, a proof of concept, but it demonstrates already, um, you know, the, the, the high interest that uh, we, can, uh, we can have in these networks. Um, and we demonstrated the first uh, implementation of a fully integrated spiking network using RERAM on CMOS. Um, uh, this network is based on a 130 nanometer CMOS process and implements an uh, analog integrated fire neurons with a recognition um, accuracy of 82% and an energy consumption of 180 picojoule per synaptic event, uh, which can be improved uh, by very simple um, uh, considerations. So this concludes my presentation and um, I thank you very much for your attention.